All right, today we're with Ben Trexel. Ben, where are you from? I'm from right here in Birmingham, Alabama. Grew up about two miles from this studio. All right, where'd you go to high school? My first two years, I went to John Carroll, and then being into guitar, I uh, wanted to switch over to Alabama School of Fine Arts, so I um, had to audition. So I auditioned with a piece by Yes guitarist Steve Howe and got in. And uh, so I spent my last two years there. And uh, an interesting side note is I graduated in the same graduating class with Suzanne Collins, who wrote Hunger Games. Okay. All right. What first got you interested in guitar? Honestly, I would say my babysitter bringing over albums when she would come to babysit. So I'd be like nine years old. She'd bring over like a Black Sabbath album, Led Zeppelin, Yes, Elton John. I mean, just great music. I mean, I was lucky enough to be 10 years old in 1973, which, you know, was one of the best little four or three year periods of music that there is from a rock perspective. And so that's how I sort of got into it. And, you know, I guess um, looking at the Thin Lizzy albums and the guys on the back, they got the Les Pauls, and I was like, man, that is super cool. And then what totally ruined me is seeing Kiss in 1975. I was very young, and they were pretty, pretty explosive at the time. So that's pretty much it. All right. Your first band. Well, we had neighborhood bands from age 11. We'd play on, we'd play concerts on porches. Mm -hmm. um, my first, I guess, if I look back and say, what's my first real show with a real audience? I was about 14 years old and played at the CYO house at St. Francis Xavier Church. And there was about 150 people there. And um, we played, you know, some covers, played some Boston, played some Joe Walsh and uh, probably some Zeppelin and you know so that was like probably my first band you know okay and where'd, what happened how did you evolve into making your living in music well let's see I mean I started I started playing clubs when I was 16 you know played down at Diamond Gems and then I played at the Nick when I was 17 um you know, I mean, I would say it's making a living, but it's making some some money, you know. And I was teaching guitar a little bit, started getting into that. And um, I guess if it wouldn't have been for getting into recording, I probably would not have continued on because I like the recording side. And I love the playing, I love the live side as well. I, I need to have the balance of both, though. Um, if I did all live performance, I probably wouldn't be happy. If I did all studio performance, I probably wouldn't be happy either. Um, so I enjoy, I enjoy doing studio work and, you know, I enjoy playing, um, original music live, rarely ever get paid for that. So you got to do, you got to do a lot of cover gigs too, to sort of make up for the fact, sort of, you do the cover gigs to pay your way for the original gigs. Okay. And who taught you to record? I interned with Tony Wachter at um, Vowel Studios, you know, when I was 17, and he let me mess around on the board some after I was finished sweeping. <laughs> and uh, I would say that was the first experience. Um, Mike Panapinto and uh, the guys over at Poly Music, and actually Davey Moore was there too. Um, he's now the head sound man here at Workplay. He was an engineer there. He had just gotten off the road with, uh, I believe, I don't know, Frank Zappa or Kansas or somebody, and Mike Penapinto got him to come back to Birmingham and try to start a studio, Poly Music, over in Green Springs. And um, so I picked up some stuff there. And then I always had a desire to do it on my own, so I started out with little four tracks and just did what I could on four track. I love the idea of overdubbing. I love the idea of like laying down a rhythm part and being able to go back and put a lead part on top of it 
And if you don't like that lead part, do it again, do it again. So I developed a sort of a sense of perfection about what I wanted and, you know, and that, that, you know, that's the creative side to me is not just recording, but like producing and like adding parts on top of parts and doing things to create these vibes. And that's my biggest influence on that area would be Jimmy Page because that's what he did with Led Zeppelin. They would record a basic track in the studio. John Paul Jones and John Bonham, they were out of the picture from that point. And Page just went into the laboratory and he'd like try this guitar part and this guitar part and this guitar part and layer them and put them on different sides. And uh, so as I was saying, um, you know, I like the way that Jimmy Page would take um, different guitar sounds and different textures and different parts and sort of make, create almost like a rock orchestra. People really didn't look at Zeppelin that way, but that's really, if you listen to their music, it was that way. There was like five, six, eight guitar parts going on at one time. But they were able to create this image live that they were this, you know, four-piece band, which they were. But Jimmy Page, is the way he worked in the studio was a big influence on me because it I just like that ability to create sonic textures and stuff with with overdubs and um, so I tell a lot of my clients that you know I see a, uh, the recording a record as opposed to a live performance is much like the difference between a movie and a play a lot of times people come to me and they go like well I don't want to record anything that I can't do live I said well you know if Led Zeppelin took that attitude they wouldn't have sold 110 million albums I just think, you know, you have to look at each medium for what it is. Live is imper imperfect, it's energetic, it's emotional, it is what it is. Records, you know, I mean, I like making records that are more precise. Some people don't, that's fine, you know, it's just the way I do it. Okay. Who was your greatest influences as far as the recording side of you? I don't have a greatest influence. I mean, like I say, Paige would be my greatest influence. But as far as just more like the producing and engineering, and there's so many greats out there that, you know, I'm influenced by all the people that get great sounds. Brendan O'Brien has done all the... I mean, if you Google his resume, it's that long. Um, he's a great producer, but I like... Um, I like Rick Rubin, I mean, for what he does with, stuff, with uh, Chili Peppers. I mean, I like a producer that can really get the most out of whatever band they're working with and, and capture what that band's essence really is. And um, so I have a long list of producers that I like, really. In your work, what do you feel is the piece de resistance, the, the top dog? Of the work I've created, what's my uh -huh. best work? Well, I mean, that changes every every year, really. I mean, I created my own production company about five years ago, and I've been working with, I've probably produced 10 different acts over that time, some of them multiple songs. I've, one of my artists, Amacio Favor, I've done probably 25 songs with. And um, I really, you know, he's great, and I do think that he will have huge success in his career. Um, but I mean, I've started, I've just started working with some clients in the last couple of weeks that are extremely talented. So it's really hard to say. I mean, I did a little project of my own called Apple Space Bar, which is, we did four albums and it's more of a recording project, sort of like Steely Dan. We didn't go out and play live that much, but it was just for fun and more artistic. But I've had to learn to, um, set some of my artistic desires aside and, and focus on doing what I need to do for the current climate so that I can make a living. So I've been getting more into electronic music lately, trying to, you know, I hate the fact that people say guitar is dead and everything. I hate that, but it, it you know, I'm having to deal with that reality. So trying to cut back on the guitar a little bit but I do hope I do hope the younger generation will appreciate guitar again at some point it's not really being appreciated at the moment but um, so it's just a never-ending uh, correction process yeah some of the bands and projects you've been involved with that people would recognize 
Well, right here at Workplay, we, we um, recorded a Trains live album back in 2006 or seven. Um, I produced the first two Live in the X Lounge albums at Airwave, which people still talk about because it was sort of a unique thing. They brought in up and coming bands, which are now famous, um, to, to do like a little radio show and play live in the studio and we captured it and put out records on it. So we, we worked with Fuel, Matchbox 20, Creed, um, Edwin McCain. I mean, a huge list of, you know, people that are still recognizable today. Train, of course. Um, you know, here at Workplay, I worked on Duncan Sheik's live recording. I worked on Brandy Carlisle's live recording, uh, Paul Thorne's DVD, which was cool. Um, and then I, you know, I've, I've composed some music that has appeared in um, a couple of films and TV shows. Got a couple of Emmy nominations. We did a documentary here with a local producer named Sharif Simmons and... Um, it was called Mr. Dial Has Something to Say. It was about Thornton Dial, who's a sort of a famous uh, folk artist. And um, so that album received some kind of Emmy nomination. And I also composed some music for a documentary called Facing the Storm, the Story of American Bison, um, Bison, um, American Buffalo. And... Uh, had a couple of songs on some New Line Cinema films, but I mean, I'm still trying to uh, achieve a little bit higher level of success at this point, especially with my production company. Okay. Somebody comes see you here at Workplay. How could you benefit? How, how could you make it beneficial for them? Well, I can give them a quality product at a reasonable price. I mean, that's really all I can promise. Um, you know, so much of this business de depends on how motivated the artist is to get out there and promote themselves. I mean, I can't do that for them. You know, I can help them create a great product and give them something that they're proud to go promote. That's the problem with a lot of artists is that they do something and artists being artists, 90% of them hate what, hate what they've done. You know, I don't know why that is, but it's just the way it is. Especially if you go into a studio and come out with a piece of a product that you know does not stand up in the marketplace. So my singular goal is to give someone a product that they would hand to anyone in the music business, hold their head high and say, yeah, this is me. And uh, I, don't, I think if you don't have that, you're not going to make it because you're not going to believe in it yourself. And if you don't believe in it yourself, nobody's going to believe in you. So that's basically what I can offer is a great product at a very fair price. Audio and video. Absolutely. Been trying to get into video more recently um, because obviously, I mean, I tell all my clients this too. You know, if you have a great song but you don't have a video with it, it's not enough anymore. The younger generation, they want to see something. They want to look at something. When we were young, we stared at album covers because we didn't have any video. But you got to have something to look at. I mean, you can't get a young person to sit there and listen to three songs in a row by an artist that they've never heard. Just can't. You know, you got to have a visual component. And the good thing is, is that videos don't have to be these hundred thousand dollar productions anymore. They can be like made in your living room. They can be. It doesn't matter how bad they are. They just have to exist. That's my opinion, anyway. Okay. Your personal opinion of Bieber? I like one of his songs. I can't remember the name of it, but it was pretty cool. But the reason I liked it was the production was cool. I liked the music behind it. You know, as far as... I mean, he may be a great singer, but I'm not. I don't. I don't know if he is or not because I don't really. I don't really listen to him. Okay. I like Lady Gaga though. You do. Okay. I think she's a very talented person, and uh, I think she's she's the real the real deal to me, um, as far as you know all these these pop artists go. You know. 
Um, you know, I'm not totally in the pop world, you know, like Katy Perry and all that stuff, but, you know, some of my productions go in that direction, but, you know, I just assume listen to Tom Petty or something. Uh, okay, it's a good ending.